How many of you are familiar with the name Anthony Bourdain? Anthony Bourdain. Yeah, some of you are. You know, he had a very, very popular program on TV called Parts Unknown, where Bourdain, this celebrity chef and cultural observer, would go to different parts and sample cuisine and <clears throat> talk about the culture to which that cuisine was founded. As you know, uh, tragically, this past um, June, June 8th, uh, Bourdain committed suicide. He uh, took his own life. Uh, Bourdain struggled with issues in his own life, even though he was famous and even though he um, had quite a following, Bourdain just struggled handling all the pressures of life, the ones outside of him and the ones inside of him. In fact, um, Bourdain had a tattoo in Greek on one of his arms um, that essentially translated this, I am certain about nothing. So even though he uh, traveled a lot, even though he had this very popular show, uh, Bourdain experienced a lot of tension. Back in about 2014, a magazine called Men's Journal interviewed Bourdain. They were asking Bourdain about the benefits of hedonism, <laughs> the benefits of hedonism, because Bourdain had a lifestyle at times that seemed to reflect that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, philosophy. Hedonism, as you know, is a philosophy or a doctrine or a way of life that says happiness and the pursuit of pleasure and self-indulgence is one of the highest goods. And that if we do that, that's how we'll live a fulfilled life. And so the people in Men's Journal asked Anthony Bourdain about hedonism. They asked him, what are the benefits and what are the risks? Here's what Bourdain said. Look, I understand that inside me, there is a greedy, gluttonous, lazy hippie, you know. I understand that there's this guy inside me who wants to lay in bed and smoke weed all day. Watch cartoons and old movies. I could easily do that. My whole life is a series of stratagems to avoid and outwit that guy. I'm aware of my appetites, and I don't let them take charge. Someone else asked him this, well, how would you handle regret? What are your biggest regrets? You must have some in your life. Here's what Bourdain said. Regret is something you just have to live with. You can't drink it away. You can't run from it. You can't trick yourself out of it. You just got to own it. I've disappointed and hurt people in my life, and that's something I'm going to have to live with. You, you eat that guilt, and you live with that guilt, and you own it. You own it for life. I imagine that Bourdain, even though he had a lot of success on the outside, lived with an incredible amount of tension on the inside, wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think that deep inside him, he fought constantly back and forth between the lazy, hippie, marijuana-smoking person and the personage who wanted to be on television, who wanted to be a cultural critic, who wanted to be seen as one of the great celebrity chefs. There was that tension inside of him. Now, maybe when I read that, you might have said to yourself, I feel a little of that tension sometimes. I feel a little bit of that inside me as well. I, I feel some of those very same struggles. I do. Um, maybe um, not quite as uh, intense. Maybe not in that particular area like Bourdain, the area of hedonism. But maybe the tension you have is more along the lines of perhaps some um, reference anxiety where you see the success of other people or the careers of other people, and you wonder why you're not there. Or maybe that neighbor that you know gets new windows and you need new windows, and you wonder why you can't have those, and inside you fight back and forth. Why am I not a success? Maybe you'd like a car, and you see your neighbor have a new car, and they pull up in their driveway, and your car... Every dent is just an addition. And you say to yourself, why can't I have a car like that? You know, there's a film out there called The Joneses, which talks about envy and talks about this reference anxiety. 
We all struggle, perhaps, with a little bit of that. Maybe, in a more serious note, you want to be a faithful woman or a faithful man. And yes, I say faithful woman and faithful man, but there are things on the computer or things on your phone that just tempt you over and over again. And maybe you pull that up in the midst of a very stressful moment, or maybe um, you hide out because you're feeling depressed, and just for that one moment, you take a look at those pictures and you say to yourself, feel good about that. That's the tension that uh, some of us might have. Maybe you evaluate your spiritual life according to someone else's. They seem to be so far on down the road, and you ask yourself, why am I not there? Why can't I be like that? And maybe a certain amount of envy crops up inside you. Oh, there's multiple things that go on inside us, because I think all of us, in some ways, while not Anthony Bourdain, we all have a certain amount of tension inside. We wrestle inside with, um, with what we might call our flesh, or our old nature, or however we want to look at that, something internal inside of us, and, um, and, and we fight it, and we fight it, and we fight it. Well, if you're there, hopefully this message in some ways will be a comfort, and hopefully it'll be a challenge, because the Apostle Paul wrestled with those same kind of things, his own nature, his, his struggle with himself. So if you have your Bibles Turn to Romans chapter 7. Now, we've been in this series in the book of Romans called It's All Good. And uh, last week, we talked about freedom, remember, and how Paul wanted us to stay free. And he wanted to remind us again to live under grace, not under law. And we used that illustration of being married to Mr. Law as opposed to being married to Mr. Grace. And Paul wants us to know that, hey, there's a great freedom in Christ, and and we have it in Jesus through what he's done. But there's something else that we fight that sometimes crashes into that freedom, and that's the struggle. That's the struggle with ourselves, our our humanness, our our lives. Um, and, And Paul, Paul here had that same struggle. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at Romans chapter 7. Verses 7 on down to the end of the chapter. Now, I must tell you that these are some of the most difficult verses that you can look at in the Bible. They really, really are. Um, If you do any studies in the commentaries or you read, you'll discover that there are multiple views of what Paul is talking about here. Multiple views. Multiple views about what Paul is trying to to say. Um, Is he relating to himself? What really is this passage talking about? Um, After all, Paul talks about um, verse 13 of chapter 6, not offering the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but offer them uh, yourselves to God as those who are brought from death to life and instruments of righteousness. So Paul is talking a little bit, and there seems to be an appeal to that, instruments of sin or instruments of righteousness. Paul lived with a certain amount of tension in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 25. Now, how do people view this? Because you might read this and you might say, well, what is Paul really talking about? Well, there are some here who say this is Paul's struggle before he became a believer. This was his struggle. Before he was seized and he had that, we could almost say, Christophany, that, that view, that moment when he uh, saw Jesus on the Damascus Road. Prior to that, Paul's talking about that experience. The tension he had in his own soul with the law and living out what we will see in a moment was given to him when he was younger. Some see it that way. Other people see it as Paul's struggle uh, post-Christian. In other words, uh, this is a struggle that Paul had and that we all have. And this is the traditional view, um, a view that I think has a lot of credence to it, and I rest a bit in it myself. I think think it is that. I think Paul's talking about the struggle he has living out what he knows he should live. This was the view of Calvin and Luther and Augustine and other people. There's another view that uh, people see. They see this as Paul using it as an analogy 
of mankind. This is man's experience in life. So it isn't about Paul himself, but it's all about humanity itself. And, and he's just using himself as sort of a metaphor or an illustration of mankind's struggle. Other people see it as a Christian or perhaps someone trying to live the Christian life under the law or a legalist who tries to say, I know that I can handle these issues in my soul and these issues in my life on my own through legalism. Some see it that way. And others see it as uh, Paul struggling with his own identity and he is wrestling with being the Christ follower he should be and some of the older memories and things that haunt him over and over again and he fights. I think, I think it's a little bit of number two and a little bit of number five. I think it's a little bit of both. I think there's a battle in our lives. I think this is Paul talking about a real, genuine battle in his life because if you read this text, you'll see that I comes in there an awful lot, the pronoun I, 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 I. And Paul seems to be saying, hey, I'm, I'm talking to you straight. And he's saying, you know, I've told you about this great freedom that we have in Christ, but I want you to know it's not easy to stay free because we have, we have this humanity about us. We have this, this inside, these memories. We have inside of us um, temptations to sin, and sin is a powerful thing. And uh, even though Christ has taken away our sin, sin still lingers and it still tempts us and it's still powerful and we still have to deal with it because we have to be like Jesus. We have to walk in progressive faith and progressive um, Christ-likeness. And I think that's what Paul's talking about. Talking about this tension and you might identify with it here. So let's go on down and take a look at how this works out. Let's talk about this tension, living with this tension inside each and every one of us. Let's talk a little bit about living with this tension this morning as we look at Romans chapter 7. The first thing that we uh, learn here from this text is, is that this tension began early in life. This tension began early in life. Listen to what Paul says. What shall we say then is the law of sin? Now people, again, remember Paul keeps kind of using these statements again because people were saying, well, look, if the law stimulates sin and the law brings about this death inside of you because of it, is it sin itself? And Paul will just again say no. As we're going to see here in verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Paul is saying the law is a holy thing. It's a holy thing. It shows us the character of God. It shows us how to live. The law is a good thing. It's a holy thing. And as we'll see, that holy thing, though, stimulates us in the wrong directions, unfortunately, because of our nature, because of who we are. So let's look what he says. He says, first of all, what shall we say? And he puts that to rest. No, the law is not unholy. It's not sin. For I have not known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. Now, it's interesting Paul would say that. He uses the last of the Ten Commandments there. You shall not cover your neighbor's house or household or wife or goods. He uses that because that is a really internal issue. Paul, Paul didn't know this. He goes to the Ten Commandments and says, you know, the other ones are kind of outward in some ways, but this is internal. Coveting is, is kind of the start of everything. Francis Schaeffer said, coveting is really the baseline for everything that we do that's sinful. We want something, we want something, we envy, we covet, we want it. It's sort of the baseline. And Paul says, yeah, I didn't know what coveting was initially. Let's look at this, verse 8. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded to it by the command. So notice the opportunity there. This baseline, the, the baseline that sin uses is the command. This is how sinful sin is. It takes a good thing like the command and it turns it into a bad thing. It uses this good command as a military base, as it were, to spring off and attack you. That's how sinful sin is. It has a way of using it. That word there, the opportunity afforded to it is a military term. It's a base of command. And sin uses the commandments 
as a base to launch off and attack you, which shows the deceptive nature of sin. Let's keep reading. Do not covet, but sin seizing the opportunity after afforded the opportunity produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law. Now when you read that, you might say, what does he mean by that? What does he mean alive without the law? What does he mean? That's an interesting statement. Um, I think Paul's talking about here when he was a child. I think he's talking about the fact that he grew up and he was a sensitive child. Children don't always know what sin is as they grow. And they don't until somebody tells it to them. And when would Paul, who was Jewish, understand that? At his bar mitzvah. At a bar mitzvah, a 13-year-old son was called the son of the commandment. And at that point, they were responsible to fulfill the law of God. They were responsible. Up until that point, some of the young children didn't know. It's kind of like me. I grew up in a tradition where I was a kid, I was fancy free, and I, I didn't know everything about sin. But then I started following different steps within the church that I belonged to, and I took my first communion. And when I took my first communion, guess what? I understood why I was taking my first communion, because at that point it was made known to me that I was a sinner. And I needed to take communion in that tradition to handle my sin. But up until that point, I didn't know a lot about sin. Oh, I knew that I acted it out, but I didn't know all the sins that were out there and all the things that were available to me. And then I kept moving up and up through that particular tradition, and then I began to see, wow, I really do violate a number of things. And I think Paul is saying here, it starts young and you kind of work your way up. And he said, all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, that's a sin, that's a sin, that's a sin. When he was younger, prior to his bar mitzvah, some of those things just, he was alive. I didn't know anything about this. Suddenly I realized I've got this old dead, I've got this nature inside of me that needs to be taken care of. Look at verse 10. I found that very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. This commandment that was supposed to keep me alive that was supposed to help me live life actually brought death. It made me feel dead inside. It made me feel sinful inside. For sin to bring, notice, for sin, seizing the opportunity, again, that military term, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous. Notice that. Paul says this, this commandment that was supposed to inspire me turned out irritating me. It turned out irritating me. It turned out to be a base um, of, of, of my sinful nature, which just shows how deceptive sin really, really is. Notice it said here, afforded by the commandment deceive me. Sin is deceptive. It promises more than it gives. It says if you do something this way, you'll feel better. Well, you do for a moment and then you feel horrible. You know, you eat something, and, and uh, just as an example, you eat something, and wow, you know, all of a sudden it tastes good going down, but then you get bloated, and then you just eat too much, and it's deceived you. And that happens, and that's what sin does. It's very, very deceptive. Promises much, much more. Just like Eve, Paul is probably going back into the garden where Satan says to Eve, hey, you'll be like God. You'll get all this knowledge. And so she sins. Adam does too. And they realize, uh-oh, sin deceived us. It promised this, but it gave us this. Separation away from God. Sin's deceptive. But notice what Paul says. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Paul says it's good. Doesn't mean that the commands or whatever are sinful. They're holy, righteous, and good. It's us. We have met the enemy, and he is us. And that's the problem. And, and we should not get angry at the law, nor should we look at the law 
in a bad life. It's kind of like someone who runs out into the ocean, <clears throat> swims around, gets out, and all of a sudden sees a sign that says, no swimming, sharks are present. <laughs> and the person can say, oh, that's horrible. They shouldn't put that sign up. Or the person can say, gee, I wish I would have read the sign. I wish I would have read the sign. I wish I would have read it. And that's kind of what Paul's saying, that the commandment's like that. It's a sign. It's a good thing. You don't get angry at the sign, right? The sign's trying to help you. And so Paul says here, listen, that's the deceptiveness of sin. It, it takes even these good commands and it twists them. Now notice verse 13. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good. So that through the commandment, sin... Now this is an interesting statement, isn't it? Sin might be utterly sinful. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? Sin might be utterly sinful. Sin stinks. That's what he says. It stinks. It, it doesn't do you any good. And Paul's trying to say it stinks. It just stinks. It, it deceives. It has a momentary pleasure. We all know this. We all know this. This is our experience, is it not? I'm not going to have you raise your hand because then we'd all be guilty. But the point I'm trying to make here is, is that Paul just keeps saying this is the struggle I have over and over again. And it's a struggle that others have too. You're not alone in this. Even Paul the great, great apostle, the one who was seized on the Damascus Road and had a conversion experience unlike any of us have ever had, struggled with this same issue. So Paul now talks about this fight that he had in the past, but I want you to see something. In verse 14, he switches from the past to the present. So this is, this is what I've been fighting. This is what it's been over and over. This is what's been going on. Let's look at verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. The law is a good thing. It's a spiritual thing. It teaches us about God's character and shows us how we're to live and teaches about morals. But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave of sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. In other words, when I sin and the law says it's sinful, I agree that the law is right. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. There's this residual, this nature. There's something inside of us. Humanness, flesh, whatever we want to call it, it's in there. And he says here, I wrestle with this. Knowing nothing good lives in me, that is my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Do you ever feel that way? I have a desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. No matter what I do, I can't will it out. I can't self-discipline it out. There's something in there. For what I do is not good. I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this keep, I keep on doing I do not want to do it. This I keep on doing. Now, if what I do, I do not do what I want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin living in me. Wow. Tension inside. Paul is just saying, this battle to stay free, this battle to become like Jesus, this battle to put away the old memories, the old things inside, the habits of my body, the issues of pride, all of this stuff that I had, this battle just keeps going and going and going. And Paul says... The tension inside us continues when we try to relieve it on our own. The tension inside us continues even when we try to relieve it on our own. No matter what we try to do to fight it over and over and over, this tension continually, continually works inside of us. Oh, there is something we can do, and we'll see that in a minute. But Paul is saying, man, I, I just can't seem to get a, my arm around this thing. The third thing he says is our inability to relieve this tension inside us creates even more tension inside us. <laughs> do you ever feel that way? Gosh, I'd like to do, I, I want to get rid of this thing. I just 
want to get rid of this thing, and you get even more frustrated and more tense and more difficult. Look what he says. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For my inner being, I delight in God's law. There's this, ah, oh, I do. I want to be what God has inside me. I want to be that. I want to be a lawful person. I want to be that person. But I see another law at work in my members, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? That tension just goes on and on. But I want you to listen to what he says. Notice he doesn't say, what will rescue me, does he? He says what? Who will rescue me? Who? Christ. Christ will rescue us. As we're going to see in the, in the weeks ahead, not in the next few weeks as we push through Advent, but as we come back into the book of Romans in the new year, we're going to see who that who is. We're going to see the only way we can really press through this tension is to pay attention to the Holy Spirit. It's to pay attention to the Holy Spirit. The only way we press through this tension is to pay attention to the Holy Spirit who continues to work and develop Christ in us. So where do we go for relief? Where do I find relief? We find relief in Christ. We find relief in understanding who we are in Him, which Paul is trying to tell us in the previous chapter as well. Notice verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, that's it. Thanks be to God. It isn't more will to follow a list of rules and regulations. It's not that. It's the who. It's understanding our identity in Christ and who he is making us to be. And it is paying attention to the work of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. As Paul talks about in the book of Galatians, when it comes to living and walking in the Spirit. And we'll talk about that. So Paul finishes it up. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Let me finish up with an illustration out of my own life. Several years ago, my friend and I, um, we were a little bit more bold back then. You know, the older you get, sometimes you don't act as bold as you used to. And uh, we were really bold at the time. So we decided that we would go diving at uh, Point Lobo State Park in uh, Carmel, Santa Cruz area. Uh, Point Lobo State Park down there is a beautiful, beautiful place. It's a beautiful place. You get under the water and you dive there and you see so many beautiful things. And uh, there are some sea otters there. There are all kinds of things. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a really great place to dive. But it is also known as the Great White Triangle. So we decided, <laughs> we decided that we would go diving anyway. So we thought, let's go diving. And people do dive there. It wasn't like we were diving in uncharted territory. People dive there all the time. But it was also known as the Great White Triangle. In other words, there was an area just right around Point Lobo State Park down there where a number of great white had been seen. And, uh, but we decided, well, you know, the possibility of you know, getting bit by a shark is pretty minimal. Again, we're pretty bold on this. So... Um, so anyway, we go down there, and uh, we're diving, and we didn't see any great white shark. We, we did see some, some sea otters, some sea lion. I mean, it, it was fun. I mean, I had literally, I had one of them come right up in my face and look me in the goggles. Like, what are you? What are you doing in my space? And it was great. It was a great experience, except when I decided that you know, it was time. My air was getting low, and I decided it was time to go up. Um, Doug had already gone up, and I stayed up a little longer, and I decided to go up. And unfortunately, I didn't pay good attention because I ended up in a big, big pod of floating kelp. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen those big, long 
tangly kelp on the, on the shore. Well, I ended up right in the middle of that. Now, here I am in the great white triangle. <laughs> I'm struggling in a pot of kelp, and from underneath, I thought to myself, I look like a meal. <laughs> I did. I thought, I look like a great meal. Here I am caught in this kelp forest. The tide, by the way, is going out. <laughs> And I'm caught in this kelp forest, and I thought, I'm just a great meal for a great white. He's going to look underneath and go, boy, that looks yummy. (laughs) And it it was a little bit fearful. My friend Doug had already made it to the shore. And uh, I was out there, and I'm telling you, I was was kicking, and I was swimming, and I was slashing. I took my knife out. I was cutting through this thing. And the current kept coming out, and I kept going further, you know. <laughs> and, I'm, and, and, and my friend is saying, keep, keep coming, Tom, keep coming. And I kept saying, well, I'm trying, and I'm trying, and I'm trying, you know. And uh, finally, I mean, it was about 30 minutes. I mean, I had cut my way, kicked my way. I was utterly exhausted. I mean... I, I finally swam to shore. I got on the shore. I came out with my flippers and fins on, you know. I took my buoyancy control vest off, my tanks. I threw them in the sand and fell flat. I mean, boom, I just laid there, you know. I mean, I was exhausted, absolutely exhausted, just tiring. I mean, I'd been fighting and fighting. So I got home. Three days later, and I got a magazine in the mail, my dive magazine, and lo and behold on the cover, what to do when you get yourself in a kelp forest. (laughs) You know? And it was so simple. (laughs) It was so simple. I mean, I was slashing and cutting. I got out, but oh, the work, oh, it was a mess. I was so exhausted. And I kind of use that as a metaphor of Where we're going next in the book of Romans, Paul says, it's not hard, it's simple. The magazine, in some ways, to me, represents the Holy Spirit. And the way you can just do, we keep in step with the Spirit and keep in touch with the Spirit. And the magazine, to me, kind of reminded, reminds me of that. Because here I am fighting with everything I've got for all the things I think I should do. And I find it was exhausting, tiring, and it's not a good memory, per se. The good memory is getting the magazine. That's a, great ma- that's a great memory because it's the, it reminds me of the spirit who says, listen, know your identity. The only way you're going to press through this tension is to pay attention to me. That's, that's what Paul's going to say, and that's what the rest of Romans is about. Pay attention to what the spirit of God is doing in you, and then you can press through that tension. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for putting this part of your word in there for us to read. For some of us, it's relieving to know that we're not alone in the battles of our soul and all that goes on inside us and this battle we have on a regular basis. Um... Some of these physical desires and things that we need and other things inside like pride and envy and all of the things that are described in Galatians 5 as the flesh and that work. Lord, I pray that for some this has been encouraging because they know if they're struggling, their struggle's not alone. For others, I pray that they will um, be more and more curious and committed to keeping in step with the Spirit to understanding who they are. And, and Lord, I pray for some it will be relieving that, that there is a way that they can get out of the kelp forests of life. And there's a way that they can walk with you and press through the tension that is inside them. And so, Lord, as we continue on, help us to, to just be excited about what you reveal about our life in Christ and living in step with the Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.